suffering in the prison without a charge or trial in Eritrea since 2001. His presence is not alone. There are many other Eritrean journalists in this situation. We here gather here and use this moment to shine the light on Eritrea. Mr. Isak was arrested in a crackdown on the media that appeared September 2001. The last time he was here was in 2005. His present location is unknown. In an independent international journal of media professional anonymously recommended Mr. Issa in recognition of his courage, resistance, and commitment to freedom of expression. This recommendation was endorsed by UNESCO Director General Irina Oboka. UNESCO Director General endorsed Dawit winning this year to 2017 award. Defending fundamental freedom calls for determination and courage. It calls for fearless advocates. This is the legacy of the president of UNESCO and his the message we send today with this decision is to highlight the work of David Issa. I welcome my friend Powers here now to read as an expert of David's reading. Good evening. Before I read, I'm going to read uh, through uh, who is David and then a couple of letters that he wrote and then to see if that makes him an enemy of the same. For a little background, <coughs> on some eight pages, David Isaac is one of our well-known writers, a playwright and journalist. He moved to Sweden in 1987, where he later became a citizen and went into self-imposed exile. After the independence of Eritrea in 1991, he returned to his homeland to become one of the founders and report of the report of Satit the first independent newsletter in the country. He was, no, he, was, he, was, he was known for his critics and his insightful reporting. He also set up a child, children acrobatic and a circus, circus theater together with um, Joshua, which has been seen here in, in the couple of clips. Now I'm going to read a letter down with Rob. And then you can ask yourself, does, does this person make him state of, of the uh, enemy of the state in prison for 15 years? Dawit writes, is it to recall that in the, in the 1490s edition, Satip published an open letter written by the village executive addressed to the office of the president of the state of Eritrea calling for an immediate lift of the ban imposed on the village Shingora Farm Land. As the letter was published, as the letter was published without further investigation, of Satit has said to study the matter in order to provide a clear picture pertaining land dispute between the two neighboring villages. A question naturally asked is why in the 100 hectare of 
arable land, the source of the views, disputes of the neighboring village, Shingora and Bet Gavru, left unused. And then David goes <coughs> to an elderly man. I will start it with an elderly, an elderly um, Eritrean saying hello to David. Hello, Zwiti. Can we wait go? As I have heard from my parents who have witnessed in the first hand, the first person who owned the land was Abune Borka. Then it was passed to another Italian development by the name Boyondi. I remember frequently going to the area during my child herding goats and fetching small farm woods. Then came Bikini, Bikini and followed by Felodi. Later, Felodi took the land from Ortola and the one replaced it by Ernesto Ortola. Again, another developer by the name Ernesto Bianco took the land from Ortola. Of course, I remember well Ernesto Bianco. Later, it was passed to the Catholic fraternity, in which we clearly expressed our discontent. Not in our opposition, the frat conceded for joint venture. Hence, 51 family who were cultivating the land with them struggled enough. Now we have encountered some who claim ownership to the land but have never been in the scene of four generations while the land has gone under a cycle of change of hands. We have never heard of such claim from their fathers and grandfathers as they never cultivated the land. Quite confusing. <clears throat> Dawit goes on outlining the finding and his investigation. He concludes, Dispute land was left bare, bare the last summer. If the government banned the two parties from cultivating it, why not it take initiative to, to develop it? Then the, this was the question I was about to ask, administrator of the region, Mr. Mohammed Said Barre. But as I mentioned early, he, de he declined to comment. The villagers appealed to administrator to lift the ban and let them support their family, did not receive any positive reply. Not only that, as the inhabitants claim, that there, the three villagers who cultivated parts of the designated band area were taken into custody and stayed for 48 hours in prison without charge, together with two others who did not even cultivate the land. Thank you very much. I will leave that judgment to you. Thank you. Uh, I'll be reading the introduction part of the G15 letter that was sent to the government. And the G15 is uh, a body of 15 people who were government officials back then. And as a result of this letter, uh, the G15 and also the other six journalists were arrested. The letter was too long, but I'm just going to be reading the, the introduction part of the letter. So the letter goes like this. This letter is a call for correction, a call for peaceful and democratic dialogue, a call for strengthening and consolidation, a call for unity, a call for the rule of law and for justice, through peaceful and legal ways and means. For some time now, regular meetings of the Central Council and the, and the National Council have not been held, believing that the best way to resolve problems is through meetings and democratic dialogue. We requested twice through signed letters that President Esaias Aforki, as the chairman of the Central Council of PFDJ and the National Council of the State of Eritrea, convene meetings for, for both bodies. But he twice tried to respond positively to our request. Those of us who made these requests have, as a responsible members of both bodies, now chosen to write this letter, this open letter to all members of the PFDJ. 
most of us have been have been spent more than more than a quarter of a century in a struggle for independence, and many of us have different times served our countries, and many of us at different times have served our country at high levels of responsibility. We witnessed and taken part in the bitter struggle of our people for liberation and are now serving the front, the state and the people as members of the Central Council and the National Council. It's obvious that our, our country is in a crisis. This crisis is the result of the weaknesses of the PFDJ and the government and the invasion of our country by the enemy. Our aim is to find remedies for the weaknesses of PFDJ and the government so that people participate in a, in a discussion and decisions that are important national issues to enable Eritrea to come out of this crisis, to pave the road for peaceful, legal and democratic transition to a truly constitutional government and to establish and to establish guarantees to Eritrea to become a peaceful and stable nation where democracy, justice and prosperity shall prevail. In the Eritrea, reality guaranteeing and consolidating internal democracy within the PFDJ is essential to ensure a democratic process of the transition and the establishment of a democratic constitutional government. And our, our aim and message is this and only this. Thank you. Hello, I realize that I haven't done my job really well. Um, I'm supposed to facilitate this evening, but I didn't introduce myself. Uh, I'm, my name is Vanessa Baja. I'm a student here at SELAS, um, studying law first year. But I'm here as, in my role as a rights, Eritrean human rights activist. Um, this is my fourth, I think, um, Press Freedom Day celebration. Uh, but I'm born in Sweden, so that's where I've been doing most of my work um, up until coming here. And my uncle, Sim Sahaya, is a journalist who's been in prison together with Dr. Aysa. Um, he was in prison the same week for the same reason, supposedly, because he wasn't granted a trial either. Um, so I'm here in that role and will now read a letter um, that I wrote to him uh, after having a dream that he was free. Dear Sim, Last night I had a dream that you were free. Together with your daughters, I stood with my two siblings in the front row and waited for you to come through the door. You fell to your knees the moment you stepped through that door, but your girls ran to pick you up and gave you the biggest hug ever. And we cried and cried and cried. Abby kept herself anchored to your arm while repeating the words, this is real, over and over and over again. The rest of us just kept crying. We could not understand that you were finally free. Then I woke up. A lot of people ask me and wonder why I chose to get involved in your case. Some wonder why I try to influence a government that they believe will never listen. I fight because I have a responsibility, because I have no other choice. I do not think it's a coincidence that you were imprisoned and that I grew up in a country where I have the opportunity to do something about it. For me, that is reason enough to do everything in my power to give you your freedom back. But somewhere along the way, you became more of a symbol. I fought no less for that. On the contrary, the fight for your freedom evolved to include the freedom of all of Eritrea. But sometimes I almost forget that you are my uncle, the father of my beloved little cousins, and my mother's own brother. I almost forget that it's not just a symbol we're fighting for, but a human being. And when a human life is at stake, we cannot take a chance. We cannot allow ourselves to assume that enough is already being done. At that moment, every possibility and every attempt to help in any way, however ridiculous, must be considered and followed through. For when it comes to human lives, all of us who have the slightest ability to provide assistance have an obligation to at least try to do so. See, sometimes I forget that we actually never met. I know so much about you, and you're such a big part of me. The Eritrean government failed to get what they wanted when they captured you. They detained you and took away your freedom. But they do not understand that your love, strength, and courage still lives freely. It lives with us and it grows stronger with each new person who is touched by your story. If I were to promise you anything, 
it is that I will do everything in my power to make sure that the whole world has heard your story so that all of us can unite and demand your freedom together. But I will be honest with you, Sia. It is a difficult fight. There are two in government ignores us, and too few people know about your country to even care about what happens there. But this just proves to us how much work there still is to be done. And it is only when we have asserted every option that we have the right to say that the fight for your freedom is in vain. Because as long as I know that there's at least a sliver of hope for my work to have even the slightest impact on your case, I will not think about stopping. And there's always hope. See, um, I want you to know that what gives me strength to continue fighting is your courage. You knew that you would be imprisoned. All of you did. But you believe that the fight for democracy and freedom in Eritrea was greater than yourselves. You did something that very few people would dare to do. You sacrificed your own life for what you believe in. The fight for your freedom may be tough, but it's nothing, nothing compared to the battle that you have been waging alone in yourself for more than 15 years. The first thing I did when I woke up was to write down everything I remember from my dream. I will never, and I never want to forget the feeling I had when you stepped through that door and embraced your little girls. Because it is precisely this vision that is our goal. And when the aim looks like that, when the goal is so big and so powerful and full of love and wonder, then I have no choice but to continue to give my all until the day that you are free. Trust in yourself, Sian. Be strong. Hold on. You've managed for so long. Now, there's not much time left. All my love and eternal support. Your niece, Tessa. Solidarity by Peter to explain more. Okay, my name's Peter Philbot. I wrote a poem in solidarity for Derek Isaac for the Penn International Poetry Festival at the beginning of last month. And this is it. It's called How Derek Isaac Lives. Official version first. All of them are alive, the minister said. The government is looking for their safety. They are in good hands in prison. They are political prisoners and the government is dealing with them. What? Sorry, We're not getting out. It's just a, a Don't Isaac shut up in darkness. Don't Isaac alone in darkness. Don't Isaac confined in darkness. Don't Isaac unheard and unseen in darkness. Don't Isaac not forgotten in darkness. Don't Isaac not forgotten by his ruler. Don't Isaac not forgotten by his friends. Don't Isaac not forgotten by his family. Derek Isaac not forgotten by his two citizen lands. Derek Isaac not forgotten by us here today. Derek Isaac talks to us here today. Derek Isaac talks to his two citizen lands. Derek Isaac talks in his silence. Derek Isaac talks in his isolation. Derek Isaac talks in his pain and isolation. Dawit Isaac's darkness talks. Once this land had a future, people fought the struggle together, got through the pain with clear hope. A new life made by people together. All the various voices joy. All the various voices heard. All the various voices talk together. All the various voices lighten darkness. Magazines and newspapers lighten darkness. Zeme, Mekela, Keste de Bena, Admas, Tsigane, Seti. All the words tumbling out like foam, luminous like the sea at night. 
Words various as stars in the sky, words welcoming as lit windows in the night, the words that illuminate a land. Darwin Isaac helped utter these words once. But the ruler said, we know how to handle his kind. We know how to handle such people. We must waste their lives. We must destroy their lives. We must empty their lives. We must make them live in darkness. We must do this across the land. We must never end with war. War and power must be all we know. War against ourselves is the best. Anyone not fighting against my people. He is the enemy of my people. She is the enemy of my people. They must all say only my words. A new Eritrean vocabulary. Taken from the only Eritrean words, mainly into green now. I didn't hear what it was. Employed in the UNHRC, Commission of Inquiry on Human Rights in Eritrea. Apart from the names of local plants and foods. So these are the rulers and his regime's contributions to the world's common stock of words and concepts. Otto, torture position with arms tight, tight at the elbows, behind the back. Gifa, round up to check identity papers, travel documents, etc. Or seize people for national service. Bardo Celeste, zero three, as if it were a radio frequency. Presidential disinformation service or state sourced rumour mill. Even the ruler knows no one believes the official communications. Ne Hadera, people handed over to the police by security staff or officers from the military or regional administration without their names ever being disclosed or registered. Entsatse, delicious bite, unofficial payment to secure release of a prisoner. Ferro, iron handcuffs with bolts to tighten them as torture. Almaz, diet. Torture position with victims suspended by tied together elbows, just standing on tiptoe. Wase Yikiano, heirs of the freedom fighters. Conscripts into the effectively working lifetime compulsory national service used for forced labour or any government requirements. Minkesakes, government or military issued pass allowing internal travel, which is illegal without it. Lerit or Zalemish, condition which causes the sufferer to only be able to walk backwards as she is unable to control her legs and walk in a forward direction and also accompanied by trembling. <coughs> it appears the consequence of rape and other forms of ill treatment during national service. His Bawi Serwit, population soldiers. Militia used as guards, which anyone of any age not serving in the army can be compelled to join, thus making up for the loss of young people fleeing the country. These are the words of darkness, the change into endless night, closing and closing and closing all doors on their users, tight into dark, Closed boxes, boxes of wood, boxes of stone, boxes of zinc, boxes of iron, boxes of steel, boxes of concrete, boxes that are pits in the earth. The words of Dawit Isaac open up and fly. They are other than darkness. Light opening, bathing like the sea. Dawit Isaac is kept in darkness. Dawit Isaac lives shut up in darkness, but he also lives in the open light. His words help create. Dawit Isaac lives, a free man imprisoned by power, alone in its darkness. Dawit Isaac lives, shall live in the world. His words shall help rebuild. Dawit Isaac lives.
know my husband. Hi. 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 Years ago, you said that I could call in on you any time I wanted. So here I am. Again. <laughs> to remind you of to remind um, you teacher the parent teacher yeah, meeting. <laughs> and to remind you that as your wife mm -hmm. and mother of your two children, mm -hmm. that everything, everything you stood for, and everything you spoke so passionately about, loving others, freedom, mm -hmm. sticking together, all of this, <coughs> you have betrayed all of this as regards us here in Norway. If you lie there or sit there in some prison or other in Eritrea, I have to go now. Don't forget the parent-teacher meeting. It's about your daughter, your child's future. Stand up. He shakes his head and says to Helen, I know, I know, I know Helen. I know. But next time you appear in a dream, don't come up with me so suddenly. Don't do it. See the memories. I never reproach you for anything, Helen, he says. It was me. I was the one who left you. But who would have thought it would all end in this? We all thought it's going to work out. Yes, Mr. 76, now, how do you feel to be dangling up there? Hmm? Would you like to say something for us? Or just, would you like to be crucified? Tell me. If you just feel like that, just tell me. Huh? And let me. Okay. If you want to say something, just let me know. Huh? Mm, okay. He says, Don't. 
don't go. Please. Can you hear me? He says he doesn't want to hear. He says, I am your brother. He's had two weeks of this. He's on the floor. He says, no one. He wants a person, someone, anyone to talk to. He so says, no. Knock down that dead end. Stand up. If he manages to stretch up in the direction of the air vent and stand quite still, he can just about make up the sound of two guards talking. A couple of the prison guards in the distance talking to each other. Like normal Eritreans, the dialogue is inaudible, all the same. It's a, co it's a conversation in Tigrinya between two people. He collapses. No, he can't make it. Not today. Listen to this. I am quoting from a TV interview. National people may choose different priorities, but even if we are still left with hungry mouths to feed, these demands are not wrong. They are good demands. What the, what the reformers are demanding is constitutionally elected government, the implementation of free democracy and more systematic organization of the civil service. I imagine now. You know who wrote this? Oh, yes, he said. <laughs> what? What? See? And you lived. You lived. You had good reason for saying that on a TV. Is that right? Yes. If, if I, I didn't, didn't I, I wouldn't have said it. He said. Well, until the Amnalu, I'm over going here. So that I'm going to go in and you. accusing me of things. Why don't you ask me to withdraw my remarks, he said. Hmm? 
this fat little fly there that is just settled on my papers. Do you, do, you, do, you, do you really believe that this fly has the choice of whether or not to shit on my documents or whether or not he should be, he should be with our life? Do you believe that? Do you? He could just about remember the smell of fresh laundry. Eritrea is a lovely country. Is that right? Do you agree with me with that? Yes, indeed. Okay. Yes. Okay. It's a lovely country. You know that, okay? Yes. Okay. It is very difficult for you. You will never, you will never see it again. Okay? The interrogator touches the prisoner's wounds and asks him, How do you think a president feels when he knows someone intends to kill him? He says, where is this leading? Well, no one knows which way the cat will jump, said the interrogator. He said, <laughs> the cat itself. Surely the cat itself. <laughs> hey, don't give me that arrogant smile. It had no move at all, it's my soul. Do it, my soul. You strike me as remarkably strong, Mr. 36, said the interrogator. انا اقول لك حاجه عشان ما تطلع ديني وتطلع معي كلام من يوم ما بقول نفس الكلام اوكي تاخذ معي نفس من اوله هي اسكس وير دو يو جيت ات فروم اي جيت ات فروم ماي فريدوم سيد داوي نحلنا نحلنا نتنت لني نوت نتنت نايكنا نحلنا نتنت لني سيد داوي Sit down. Say thank you. Say thank you to me. Say it. Thank you. Say it now. Thank you. Say thank you, my friend. Say thank you to my friend. Say thank you, my friend. Say. Say thank you, my friend. Thank you. Say the interrogator. For thank you for being alive. Thank you for being alive. Say thank you to me. Say something to me. Say it now. The interrogator says, I have a name. I am myself. I am your brother. I have a name. I am myself. I am your brother. I am a good I am myself. I am your brother. I am your brother. I have a name. I am your brother. I am your brother.
give another round of applause to those. In this spirit, I would like to express my gratitude to the Guillermo Cano Foundation and the Helsinki and Sanomat Foundation for their support. And I would like to invite Ms. Bethel, Bethlehem Isaac, daughter of the Wittisak, to receive the prize in his name. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. President, Madam Director General, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. In 1997, I was a little girl. We lived in Eritrea. At the time, I thought every father was like mine. A teacher who taught me how to read at the age of four, always traveling, always away from our family, dedicated to helping others. But his main goal was to pursue his dreams in a new, peaceful, and free Eritrea. And by the time my younger sister was born, October 1998, that dream was, was fulfilled, and the newspaper Setit was born the first independent newspaper in Eritrea. In his own words, he said, Setit is an independent newspaper. We don't want to rely on our government or any other countries or organizations. We started free and we, and we will continue that way. Today I'm here with you to honor my father and colleagues in similar situations. I'm here to honor their uncompromising spirit and tireless dedication for human rights, democracy, and freedom of speech. This prize is a recognition of my father's work and to those who have chosen to stand up for the right of others. I feel proud, blessed, and a deep sense of gratitude. The last time I saw my father, he smiled towards me and gave me a pat on the head. Today I understand that smile was not of fear. It was not of sadness. It was the smile of hope and pride that the journey towards Eritrea's development from wartime to peacetime had begun. And that the establishment towards an Eritrean-style democracy has started. Today, 20 years later, and 15 years since I last saw him, I understand his passion and that the world is far more complex, more violent and unfair than I thought back then. Today, his life has become my inspiration, and I understand his choices, values, and compassionate aspirations. 
I understand that his struggle and dedication for social justice, peace and stability are more needed now than ever. His ways was a compassionate and forgiving response to difference of opinion. He knew that without the basic establishment of human rights, freedom of speech, access to education and health care, no society could flourish, no nation can achieve stability, and no people could prosper. He wanted to give his people an environment where they could speak freely in mutual understanding and respect, and by peaceful means give people the right to determine their own destiny. Therefore, I have decided to dedicate my life to oppose those who fight against any type of freedom, and I have decided to not fail, but to conquer and rise. Even though my father isn't here today, he would tell me not to feel anger or sadness, but hope and forgiveness. He would tell me to show understanding and focus on what we can do to help others. So I encourage the international community to engage in a fruitful dialogue with Eritrea for the benefit of my people, my blood, and the love for peace and harmony. And to my Eritrean brothers and sisters, no matter what hardship or challenges you may face, I unconditionally offer you my support, help, and an open heart. Let us build our future together. Let the free dialogue between us guide our country towards an Eritrea where we, where we all can free our minds, souls, and hearts. Let not the hard-won battle for sovereign nation, our culture, and our rights be lost because we have forgotten how to speak. In the coming years, I will focus on creating opportunities for young Eritreans that are interested in developing a strong foundation for the future for our country and to, con and to contribute to making Eritrea a more inclusive, more tolerant, a more socialist, socially just society. But if my father knew I was standing here among all you prominent people, talking only of him, he would give me the evil eye. So in solidarity, I, will, I would like to give my deepest condolences for the men, women, and children who have lost their life, been displaced, or are suffering as a result of the horrible conflict in Syria and other conflict areas around the world. And in the spirit of human rights and free speech, I hope these conflicts come to an end very soon. So in our time, it is important to keep our dignity and to be tolerant and to support the work of journalists. They are the ones who truly defend our freedom and by those who are oppressing journalists, we understand that we are not really free but under constant surveillance and our freedom is many times just an illusion or under big threat. This is not the time to give up and one day, Father, I hope to see you again, to hold your hand, and to just be your daughter. I wish that you soon will come home and be with our family. Thank you very much. Thank you to Ms. Bethlehem Isaac, daughter of Mr. Dawit Isa, 2017 laureate, UNESCO Guillermo Cano World Press Freedom Prize. Isn't just when we decide to speak about these issues. 
but are present in the political institutions, the political consequences, and the political realities of the people living here for that, um, and fleeing the country. So I think that was a phenomenal speech, um, and all my support went to Bethlehem Misak, who's been fighting for her brother's release for a very long time. Um, next up is Hadi, who's going to perform a song. And he invites all of you to join for the first song, and then the second one, I think, is a solo. The first one's a solo, the second one's a solo. You know, you can perform. are going to do that.
discussion. Um, so if you have any thoughts or ideas that you want to share with the group, write them down and we'll take them up in the discussion. Um, I think we'll start however, whoever feels for yes, go with it. Um, um, thank you for the invitation, and since we have uh, a very brief uh, uh, moment to explain the situation, the, the task I was given, the situation in Eritrea, I don't think I'll be able to do much in five minutes. What I can say, there are different reports that are being published annually that are very important. Uh, that describe the real situation in the country, reports that are um, published by international organizations. I can, only, I can mention about three of them that have uh, appeared this year, 2017. The Freedom House Report 2017 uh, categorized Eritrea as the most repressive nation on earth. Reporters Without Borders for Freedom of Information 2017 has listed Eritrea as the last country on earth when it comes to press freedom. And um, the um, corruption index reported by Transparency International, puts Eritrea as one of the most corrupt countries on earth. So I'm not going to explain exactly what, goes, what went into those reports. But I just want to tell you a small, a very, very short story that I came across um, recently when I was surfing. And I read uh, a story on Asenna.com, one of the Eritrean websites that we have. The story was written by an old friend of mine, uh, a mentor. And the story was about um, Nehradiyo. What Dr. Barakat Habtisulasi wrote was a very moving story of a woman who got so frustrated and after 15 years she decided, I think, to commit suicide. She was married to one of the G15 um, officials, former government officials who disappeared back in 2001. So she literally raised her two children on her own. But in the end, she gave up. Every time I read a story written by Dr. Berger Taktus or one of the books one of the many books that he authored. It always happens that my mind goes back uh, to the day I first met him. My mind goes back <clears throat> to the constitution that he literally drafted, authored on his own, although he was working with many other groups. When I first met him in 2000, we were deliberating why the war with Ethiopia, the 1998 war, the 1998 to 2000 went wrong. During breaks, I would always ask Dr. Baraka to tell me stories of how he went about drafting the constitution. It took a lot of effort, a long time, 
and a lot of money went into it as well. He, he was always happy to tell me stories about it. Anyway, when we finished our deliberation, we wrote an open letter, uh, a letter to the president. There were 13 of us. And we sent it to the president, but before we got to him, somehow the letter leaked out and it caused an uproar. Because that was the first time a group of people got together and complained about the situation back in Eritrea. These were the people I was with, although, although I was the youngest and, and the one who least contributed to Eritrea. Many of them were ex-fighters. And, and people of the likes of Dr. Beredet, a freedom fighter, an academic, an intellectual, who's written so much, and many of them were like him, so we traveled to Asmara in the end, but we were not received well by the press. He was annoyed that we had to go, that the letter went out, it, it leaked up to the public. He kind of asked us to apologize to the public. Of course we didn't do it, but we managed to leave the country after having a, a two hour talk with him. Lucky that we left. Alive. Dr. Barakat was not with us at that time. Anyway, the situation got worse, and as soon as we left, the president called us through the media as a group of uh, people who sound like empty barrels. We left and we started the campaign. Everyone did keep it. And we talked about many problems that Eric Chow was going through. And that continued for years. Dr. Barakat was very instrumental in putting the letter together and afterwards in working with us. Now he is in his mid 80s and he still works. He still writes, and, and I think he set a good example to, to all of us. There was so much that we could have done that we didn't do, but all the work that worked into, in, into ratifying, to have that constitution ratified, did not produce anything. Soon after, the 19, soon after it was ratified in 1997, the war with Ethiopia broke out and then, and then so many things happened. But what I'm trying to tell you here is, there's so much effort that goes into doing something, and it requires little effort to completely destroy it. I'm going to make this very, very short because I think I'm running out of time, but this is what happened. In May, on May, on the 24th of May, 2014, the president was being interviewed, as it's customary to, to, to give an interview on Independence Day. And this is what he said. Within the framework of our task of nation building, the political infrastructure assumes a vital role as a vehicle to advance our overall objectives. We have gleaned important lessons and experiences from the hostile external schemes aimed at derailing our nation building endeavors and processes. I would like to announce on this occasion that a new constitution drafting process will be launched in order to chart out the political roadmap for the future government structure. With that statement, he destroyed the constitution that was drafted, that took three years to draft, just with one statement. One small country, no constitution, uncertain destiny. 
I believe Eritreans are law-abiding people, hard-working and law-abiding people. But I can't say that. I can't say the same, the same thing about our government. I'm done. Thank you. Um, good evening. Um, just briefly, uh, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Amal Ali, and I'm an uh, Eritrean British uh, citizen. I've been living here for the last 16 years. Before that, I was living back home working uh, with the Ministry of Information as a TV presenter and uh, producer of program, different programs. So uh, I'm honored to be here uh, today and thank you for all the organizers of this event. And um, also I'm extremely proud of the young Eritrean activists like uh, Vanessa and Bedlam and many other young Eritrean who are uh, now working hard to raise the awareness of uh, human rights situation back home. Uh, in this moment, uh, to witness this, uh, the world reward in uh, David Ishaq is uh, a remarkable moment for me as a journalist in uh, uh, um, part of the uh, media establishment uh, in Eritrea. But many, uh, one thing I would like to say here, uh, David Ishaq and many other uh, journalists who established what we call private independent media, they done extremely incredible uh, work back home because that was a different voice, a free voice from what is known as official media, which I was part of it. So they were, uh, they were uh, putting the seed of what we uh, uh, believe it, if it has been given a chance for three, four years later, the story would have been really different. I remember back home when Seti, Qasid Abana, Maqal, all those newspapers were publishing uh, three times a week or, or weekly even, people were very excited because it, they gave uh, a space for regular citizen to say their say. They were talking the, uh, the language of ordinary Eritreans and they were touching issues that has to, uh, to do with daily concerns of Eritrean citizens. And this is what concerned the government, I believe. But now, today, when we talk about human rights, it is a human rights issue to, uh, to see journalists and all uh, politicians being held for years without charge and uh, without their families uh, knowing anything about them illegal action by the government, but it also has to do with the politics of the government of Eritrea. So um, a lot of um, work has been done in terms of bringing this human rights issue into light uh, by Eritreans and friends of Eritrea. But in the ground, we don't see change. Nothing is changing. Now, no one is being released or freed since the last 15, 16, 17 years, or even back at the time of the liberation. So what we need to do is that the question uh, I would like to ask today, as a journalist, I'm good at asking questions, but no answer really, but we think, I believe that the Eritrean government were, were trying always to shame activists for working with what they call foreign governments or Western government, governments and accusing them of being agents. And I think we have to step out of these fears and work with everybody as a global citizen of Eritrea to see change coming into the ground and to see that what is happening and other journalists being free. That's what I can say for tonight. <laughs> Good evening, uh, I'm Martin Platt. I was the UC Africa editor 
and I had the honour of uh, going into Eritrea on several occasions, both for the BBC and for the British Labour Party when I worked for them for five years as the Africa Secretary. And I thought I was, would just bring to you three images that come to mind. The first was in the early 1980s when I went into Eritrea itself. It was a long journey from Port Sudan and we crossed the border. It was pretty tough going up those mountains. Uh, I'm sure I had a very easy ride of it, but it was pretty tough for me in the the land cruise that we were going on. It was 36 hours and uh, we eventually got to our destination which was the information bunker. Went down to the bunker and they gave us some tea. And there were journalists who were bringing together the information that the EPLF needed in order to inform its people of what was going on. And if that was the beginning of the work that Dawit took up when freedom eventually came to his country, when he achieved the liberation for which you and so many others like it sacrificed so much. So out of that one bunker, in a sense, came the origin of all that you and he have worked for. And that he now and so many political prisoners, including my friend Hermes Debesai, now sit in jail without charge, without hope, except for you. And that's the second image I'd like to bring to you, which is one that I remember from my youth, because I too am an African. I grew up in Cape Town, walking on Table Mountain, learning to be a young man there. And down in the bay, there was always that one image of Robben Island. And on Robben Island, we all knew there was Nelson Mandela, the Pan-Africanist Congress, the Black Consciousness Movement, the African National Congress, and we could never speak their names, we could never hear from them, but they were there. And nobody had ever swum that short journey from that island to Seapoint, where we all sat and drank beers and had a good time. Nobody had ever made that journey because it was impossible, it was too cold, and couldn't be done. And yet, within a few years, although I was active, and in my lifetime I thought I would never see the end of apartheid, never. It was such an entrenched movement. And yet within a few years, Nelson Mandela stood on the steps of the city of Cape Town, town hall, and addressed that huge crowd and a few hours later then went to Pretoria where he was, then became the president of our country. What a moment that was for us all. So that's the second image. But the third image is just five minutes walk from here. It is a basement just round the corner from Euston, which was the first office of the anti-apartheid movement. It was Dr. Pitt later became Lord Pitt, who had that office, it was where he lived, he had his surgery, and in that office they founded the anti-apartheid movement. At that time it was an absolutely hopeless task, this was 1960. Everyone knew that apartheid was supported by the British government, there were something like 300,000 people with British passports in South Africa. There was kith and kin, how could you possibly change British policy? And yet, by the 1990s, just 30 years later, it was over. So I say to you, we live in a democracy. Use the tools of this democracy. Change this country's policy towards Eritrea. Work with our politicians. Get it going. And I say, next year in Asmara. <laughs> Just that you you raise the uh, image of. Uh, sorry, I should introduce myself. I'm, I'm Michaela Wrong. I'm a journalist. I wrote a book called um, "I Didn't Do It for You" about Eritrea, and uh, I don't go there anymore because uh, I don't get visas, which is true of most journalists. Um, and as Darwin mentioned, um, 
uh, returned us very badly on the Reporter Sans Frontier Index, which is quite a, uh, it has its inaccuracies, but Eritrea is just above North Korea, which is not a good position to be in, not one that anyone would want their country to be, on, be in. Uh, I wanted to thank Martin for mentioning uh, Nelson Mandela, because I too was thinking of that when I was watching that very, very moving play and listening to the music and the poetry. Um, and, um, I mean, it took so long, didn't it? Um, but everyone, I think, in this room probably remembers where they were when Nelson Mandela was released. And it showed that you cannot keep, you cannot, if you're a government, you really can't maintain a silence indefinitely if people object to it and don't, <laughs> don't want that situation. The silence will not last. Um, I think it's, I, it's really difficult for people now to gather and talk about Eritrea. I sat on a panel, uh, Justice Africa organized some meetings together, uh, three, I think it was three years ago. Every time there were problems because the youth wing of the PFDJ would turn up, intimidate people by, by filming, by um, even when we asked them not to film, by, there were Twitter campaigns before the meetings people were frightened off, and I'm sure there are members of the uh, YF, uh, PFDJ here tonight as well. Um, but, um, you know, firstly I would appeal to them, think about what you do, um, because um, what happens when you, you suppress that kind of, um, that kind of uh, human rights uh, uh, protests uh, is um, people will go silent but they don't stop minding and they don't forget. Um, and what you do is you polarize the community and the people who go silent do not love you more and they do not love their government more. And, and what you end up doing is you alienate people who were on your side quietly. Over the years, they realize they have no sympathy and they don't support the government anymore. It may take years, but it often happens. Um, so, and then I would say to everyone who is here, um, you, you have to keep going and you have to keep, keep having these kind of meetings. Um, it's, uh, the, 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 the British can, government, you talked about pressure on the British government, the EU, you know, they can only do so much. It's, at the end of the day, it's your government. Uh, and uh, you, know, you have a, a tremendous history of mobilization in, uh, in the diaspora over the years. And um, uh, it's, it's only you that can bring about change uh, back home. So I would say that you know, people like me, we watch with respect and we honor uh, what takes place. And uh, we, we, we do try and share your pain, but in the end of the day, it's, it's up to you. So. <laughs> A lot of things. If I bring hundreds of them in here, you'll be surprised. I work in a grammar school. Um, I've been working in the grammar school for six years now. Just moved last two weeks ago. And then the school, I've seen children from year seven to year 12. Their confidence, how the confidence grows up is amazing. It's amazing. Because I've seen those children grown, grown up. And when, you, when they pass year 11 to year 12, they start to wear suits, some shoes and all that. But if I go back to my country, they are in the trenches. Trenches doing war. I've, I've been listening to all the stories from, from, uh, um, from the youngsters that I go. Sometimes, it was after four Saturday to five Saturday when I start to talk to them, they start to say to me, yeah, you, need, you, can come with, you can come and eat with us now. I say, how come? Before you were running away from me. Ah, don't worry, you are one of us now. That's amazing. And they would be telling me a story like, it's all in three trenches. From, from one trench to the other trench. Walking. 10 miles, 15 miles. I can bring hundred tens of them here. So we are trying and they have got, we have got a long way to go. But there's always one thing that strikes me. Our ancestors, I hope I'm not emotional because I usually am emotional. I was trying to uh, be a little bit strong. Um, our, our ancestors used to say, 
አይዳነኒ አይዳነን አይዳነኒ አዴ ከርሐብቱ አይዳነኒ I'm not going to sleep and I'm not going to sleep until I get my freedom of my country now we need to change this one saying aidaneni aidaneni is beke hafku aidaneni somebody uh, uh, from outside um, admire it. it's amazing I should be more proud more proud amazing because he's mine right he's a Eritrean but an Eritrean coming back in here asking me why are you doing that who is he mm, there's something behind it <laughs> <laughs> I'm very proud of David. I'm very proud of all the heroes who died who didn't see a lot of things like that. Seriously, I should be really ashamed. Someone else in the panel would like to see respond? Okay, now I just wanted to make a point. Um, there is a difference, a big difference between Nelson Mandela and the G15, including David. Nelson Mandela went to trial and there was a, there was a court case. And okay, it was an apartheid Uh, court and it was an apartheid government, but he did get to the court and he, it was a public trial. This has never happened with anyone who belongs to the G15 and I, 
I find that amazing. And that's really one of the reasons why they continue to attract a lot of attention. Um, why no court case? You know, why, why has he never been visited in prison? Uh, habeas corpus. Is, uh, these are the basic issues that are what we call the rule of law. And if you don't provide them to anyone, you are not a decent or respectable government. That's basically the problem. Um, so, you know, even to not provide a, a trial in which the outcome is, is going to be decreed ahead of time, it's, it's abnormal behavior. Uh, and I think it sort of puts you out of the realm of ordinary states. Um, so that would be, but, but the point I would make is it really, though it is that could be the worst journalist in the world, he could be writing about fashion, he could be writing about, you know, the most trivial things as badly as anything. But you, there is a basic principle, you don't jail journalists in this way uh, and then never be, never answer to why you have done that. I mean, it's, it's about the rule of law and that's why there's such an issue over the G15 and Dawa Isak in particular. Mm -hmm. Show a video. There's a message from uh, Poland. Can I, can I reply first? And then yeah, we can show sure. the, if it's national security, if it's you know invasion by Ethiopia by the enemy. The fact remains that these people have been in prison for 15 years, and I try to emphasize that in my letter that these people are human beings who have kids, who have wives, who have husbands, and the fact that they are imprisoned for more than 15 years signifies that and gives us a reason to come in here today and not only honor them, celebrate them, but also emphasize where they come from and where their struggle began and hopefully will end. But it is rooted in the political situation of the country because it is because of the politics and the lack of rule of law that these people haven't been granted a trial and that we're sitting here year after year trying to get them released. Um, so that was just an answer to the question. <laughs> A word or two on this occasion where we remember our friend and fellow defender of democracy, Mr. Dawit Isaac. I thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. My name is Korom Dafla and I'm here in front of you only because I was a, a witness for 40 years, the making of history of a tormented country like Eritrea. I was part of its liberation, I was part of its new nationhood, and now I'm part of the search for democracy. The predicament in which Dawit and a lot of other sons and daughters of Eritrea find themselves in was created by one and only one factor, the lawlessness of the regime in Asmara. It was supposed to be a government that would defend law and justice. Lawlessness, in every sense of the word, is a trademark of this nation, of this government and of this regime. Lawlessness, the spirit and the letter of it, has been mercilessly butchered by a regime that was born out of the aspiration of a people that paid a big price to earn, it, to earn its independence. Dawit Isaac did not see his day in court. He was taken away and put in prison without due process of law. Many like him have had the same fate. That was stark lawlessness. The young and not so young of today are forced to serve in the army. They are forced to stay indefinitely in the army without any chance of leaving the army. The first batch 
which started to serve in 1994, is still there after 23 years. That is also lawlessness on the part of the government. Further on, there is no elected body to hold the head of state accountable. There is no press to ask, to inform the public. No budget, no statistics, no national plan. Even the ruling party didn't hold a conference or a congress since 1994. All of its elected leaders are either dead, in prison, or in exile. This is lawlessness, stark lawlessness. It's a rogue state that is holding Dawit in prison. Last week, an incident took place in Holland that lays bare this evil nature of the regime. The regime was forbidden to run a conference by the mayor of a city in Holland. The regime continued to brag on the social media that despite, in their words, the naivety of the mayor, they were holding their conference in secret. The next day, they were thrown out by the mayor out of the city in shame and humiliation. To this day, the regime doesn't accept that it had broken the law of Holland. Thus, Dawit is a victim of lawlessness, so, so much as many, many others who are victims of lawlessness in every area of the country. Dawit is one of the icons, and he remains to be one of the icons, of the law abiding against the lawless. He remains to be one of the reasons for us to fight for justice. Thank you very much. ارحقوا ودبات وراسي مدي خزين سقام قلاسي بحر خلو نبع لحباسي هزمي الريك ولو تغلاسي بعالي تايما نوز السمري حق ندبا قدم زنبري كهيدو موز بوز قبري كهيدو موز بوز قبري سامة غال سخي سامة غري الله خندا نحوة دكيري الله خندا نحوة دكيري شبد بداتي ومد الحاط وري بترحكم مسيز بيمس عتري شبد بد شبد بد شبد بد شبد بد
ve dveráti on 